We have a lot of work to do this morning. Not that I want to add a workload to your syllabi that you've received over the last 50 hours, but uh, there is some stuff we have to do. The work we started with here in chapel began with the opening song of the chapel band in the sanctuary on Monday, was continued by Ben Patterson as he invited us to participate in the invitation of Jesus to respond to him by eating the bread and drinking the wine in communion. This work is the work that we're going to continue in many and various ways throughout this year to form a worshiping community here at Westmont. Well, surprise, my title at Westmont is the Adams Chair of Music and Worship, so don't be too surprised about what I'm talking about this morning. It's not my intent to surprise you, but it is my intent to provoke you. I want to provoke you to think about worship. I want you to provoke you particularly to think about your personal role in worship and how that fits into the fabric of our worshiping community and how music in particular can be a hallmark of that role. The great challenge in our work is to take 1,200 individuals who come from a variety of places and traditions and bring them together into a worshiping community that shares a common understanding of what worship is, a common lexicon of worship language, a common repertoire of music, and a broad base of respect and sincere appreciation for acts of worship, especially those practices that may seem foreign to any of us as individuals. Take Monday, for example. Perhaps you knew and loved that opening song. You felt that opening rush of the bass. Perhaps you had never heard it before and sort of clumsily clapped along like I always do. Uh, perhaps your church has an entirely different way of celebrating communion, or perhaps it doesn't do it at all. Perhaps you had never or rarely heard a choir sing on your behalf in worship before and found that strange. Or perhaps that was the only moment where you really felt that you were in a worship service. Together over the next weeks and months, we have this opportunity to work together at this thing called worship. The work is called liturgy, a word that simply means the work of the people. It's what we all do in worship, from singing to listening to praying to reciting to action, acting on instructions in scripture, to spoken responses like the Lord be with you. Amen. Amen. Yes. Um, many churches use that to change the rhythm and the moment and concentration of worship. And we have those acts of the people that allow everybody to be brought in and understand what those chapters are. The work of the liturgy is important. So let's spend a little time in these first few chapels, especially working on it and getting it together as a community. Certainly the authors, David of Chronicles and the Psalms that we shared this morning thought that this gathering for worship was an important thing and a pretty exciting one at that. All nations, all manner of living things are called to do it. And from the trees, to the fields, to the oceans, to the heavens, you might expect and imagine that the sounds of worship will vary greatly across that spectrum of worship practice. The Jewish people had to figure out how to worship after generations of exile in Egypt, and then again after generations of exile in Babylon. Early Christians had to figure it out in the midst of Jewish communities, and then stealthily in catacombs, and then gradually in great cathedrals, and today in a concrete block gymnasium with plexiglass basketball backboards instead of stained glass windows. <laughs> That's our job. I know in my own story, the practices of worship that I have encountered have often taken some adjusting to. Sometimes they have challenged my cultural and aesthetic sensitivities, and sometimes they have brought out theological questions. I started my life as a rather mainstream Methodist, and one day coming home in the car, I asked why we read those long and boring responsive readings every Sunday from the back of the hymnal. My saintly mother responded that those were not long, boring readings, but rather they were taken from the Psalms, and they were some of the most beautiful songs ever written. Okay, then why didn't we sing them? But I didn't ask that out of respect for mom. I only later discovered uh, that that reason we didn't sing them was because my faith tradition didn't have a musical repertoire to sing them with. I didn't start singing the Psalms until I went to college and discovered a hitherto unknown to me tradition called Lutheranism. What? They knew how to sing the Psalms and other cool stuff like Bach. 
I was hooked. Major spiritual awakening. <laughs> it took another couple of decades before I started to understand more substantive differences in those traditions, like the sacraments, concepts of original sin, nuances in grace. But that could come later. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was liking the Psalms and Bach in worship long before liking on Facebook became popular. And your stories. What are some of the things you have said about worship and encountering at Westmont over the years. Here are some comments from recent surveys. I enjoy the emotion of chapel, but at first I was disengaged because I worship so differently. Hmm. Or, initially I was kind of turned off because it wasn't my thing, but this year I have enjoyed chapel more because I have changed my attitude. Now I desire to go as an active member of the community. I like this one. It has familial sense to it. My sister prepared me and told me what to expect. Chapel was very different, especially the music. And what are we singing to? A slide projector? It's so strange, there is no altar. I wonder if I should raise up my hands like everyone else. Or, I do enjoy chapel, but it took a little while to get used to it because it was the first time I had experienced a band. But that one, you guys. Well, true confession, personal. I heard a, an electric guitar for the second time in worship when I first came to Westmont 11 years ago. The first time had been about two months earlier and it had taken me quite by surprise. I was glad that I was so culturally diverse and mature by the time I visited here. Uh, my repertoire of worship songs is still expanding and while I do love the chapel band, I am still advocating for the installation of that pipe organ up there on the back wall. As Joel Patterson knows, who leads the chapel band, and I have experienced together, regardless of the musical style, a psalm, a worship song, or a hymn book can change your spiritual understanding. It can deepen your theology and even change your life. A few years ago, I learned about a not-so-recent Westmont student story from an article that Nancy Finney had written in a Westmont publication. It's a story of his experience in worship and beyond, and I'd like to share it with you this morning. Daniel Martins, a 1973 Westmont graduate, had an epiphany, and I hope you know liturgically what that term means. Those lights go off. As he sat in a practice room playing hymns on the piano, there was an Episcopal hymnal there, and I thought, oh my, where have these hymns been all my life? And if there's a church that sings them, I should probably be in it. Forty years later, Martins was consecrated as the 11th bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Springfield, Illinois. Becoming a bishop isn't something any sane person dreams about, he says. Until a couple of years ago, it wasn't even on my radar screen. I just wanted to be a successful parish pastor and be faithful in taking care of my pastoral responsibilities. He said when he first began studying at Westmont, he intended to major in political science and attend law school to prepare for a career in politics. He also loved music, however, and wanted to continue to play his French horn, something his academic advisor told him he would not have time to do. That sent me into a sort of crisis and forced me to look at what was really important to me, he says. What made my heart sing was music. In the middle of his freshman year, Martins became a music major, foregoing any ambition of a career in law or politics. His early dreams of becoming a high school music teacher morphed into an academic pursuit in music history and theory. After graduating from Westmont, he enrolled at UCSB to earn a master's degree in music history. During his studies there, he plunged into the deep historic stream of Christian liturgical music and emerged with a calling to ordination. In 1989, Martins graduated cum laude with a master's degree in divinity from the Neshota House Theological Seminary in Wisconsin. He served in congregations in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Stockton, California, and Warsaw, Indiana, before becoming a bishop. Looking back at his time at Westmont Martin's chuckles, he remembers, he remembers when an Episcopal priest from Santa Barbara spoke at chapel in Page Hall in 1970. The following day, the priest returned to celebrate communion according to the Episcopal liturgy. And he says, in righteous protest, I walked out because they were using real wine. And I had, of course, signed a pledge that I wouldn't consume alcoholic beverages. <laughs> Martins said also, they were reading prayers from a book, and I thought a real Christian shouldn't need a book to pray with. So, the Lord has a sense of humor, because look at me now, he says. 
And here's where, by the way, I'm starting my commercial message this morning. Um, if there are any uh, French horn or trumpet players out there now, um, now is the time to change your life. <laughs> we are a couple of players short in the orchestra this fall, and while I cannot promise you will wind up a bishop, I will promise you one of those not to be forgotten liberal arts experiences. And yes, we have instruments, and yes, I will back you up at your next advising session. <laughs> See me after chapel or sometime this afternoon. All right, back to more spiritual things. So. <laughs> What do all these personal experiences and stories have in common? They all involve experiences of growth discovered in the musical expressions of worship. They all include a willingness to come some distance in mindset and openness and change of attitude. They were all open to the possibility that God was bigger than their preconceptions or experiences to date. Well, hello. God is bigger than all of our preconceptions. And in worship is the place where we are invited to meet him. Where can we better discover the nature of God? Think of the encounters of worship in scripture, some of which we have sung and read this morning. The book of Revelation is in large part a description of a worship service that Ben alluded to briefly on Monday. There are fantastic images of vast pools of molten glass, winged creatures beyond description, a cast of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands or more, singing old memorized hymns enthusiastically around the throne of God and visual images of Christ that boggle the imagination. The great prophet fell to his, Isaiah fell to his knees, abjectly crying out his confession of unworthiness when he encountered God in the temple and was raised up by a six-winged flying seraphim who literally or figuratively burned away his sins with hot coals. Personally, I have not experienced that. Though I have seen Ben, Peterson, ben Patterson lifted up on the hydraulic lift with a Santa hat, but it's a very different thing. Worship is not about our tastes or our preconceptions. It is not about how we feel about this experience or style or setting or speaker. It is about encountering God in all the ways that we are enabled to do. Those things that we do in worship, the physical gestures we engage in when encountering and responding to God, whether it's singing toward a projector or a Renaissance stained glass window, listening to the word as it's shared through scripture, or a speaker's message as we engage our minds. That's our work too being served communion in a new way, singing hymns with the organ or with electric guitars, reciting thoughtfully prepared ancient prayers or praying spontaneously to reflect a personal moment of devotion, singing a new song or one that was all the rage in the time of Augustine, Luther, or King David. All these are authentic acts of worship and we need to be open to these and other Christians' expressions of worship in this place and to understand that what is normal for one of us is strange to another allow and invite and encourage each other into our worlds and welcome and be welcome in them. That will create a Westmont community of open minds that can embrace the worship languages that confront us. Many things are done to help with that. The chapel band works, rehearses, practices all summer to learn a wide variety and repertoire of songs that embrace many traditions. The Westmont choirs and orchestra bring offerings to worship weekly to enrich our vocabulary of worship. Ben leads us through a variety of Christian worship practices in ways that invite and enable our participation. We have moments in chapel like this one and the joy of hymns and the telling of stories of family history. And today, we are going to work at singing a song that you need to know. Make it part of your repertoire even if it challenges you. This is a musical setting that you have in your hands. It's the setting that Ben used to bless us in chapel on Monday. It's a blessing known as the Aaronic Benediction because in the book of Numbers, God spoke to Moses and said, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the people of Israel. We're going to sing this blessing to each other and our guests at worship throughout this year. The seniors will sing it to all the gathered families on the baseball field at graduation in May. Know it well so you can sing it confidently. You can take this music home with you today or you can put it in a basket at the door because I'll be sending you an electronic version later this week. Right now, I'm going to send the men out on the patio to learn it with Dr. Brothers and Dr. Rockebrand. The ladies will stay in here and we'll, we'll learn it with Professor Rockebrand and myself. Take 15 minutes, learn it, come back, and we'll close chapel together with it today. Here's your audition. Gentlemen, please stand. 
sing with me, if you are able. Men.